name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I'm in my kitchen. I'm frenetically preparing dinner uh, with about 30 minutes to spare before I need to get both of my children to their respective sporting uh, practices. Uh, I'm also trying to finish those last couple emails for the day, uh, typing on my phone with one hand. Um, and more out of habit than out of uh, a genuine attentiveness, I asked Laura Lee, how, how was your day? Um, expecting a fine, and then I uh, had done my duty as, as, a, as a parent. Uh, and so I'm busy doing these things, and uh, totally unknown to me, she's actually telling me about her day. Uh, but she quickly realizes that I have not paid attention to a single word. Um, and then finally she says, Dad! And I look at her and I said, Lord, can't you see I got my hands full? She's like, you asked me. <laughs> and that's when I take a deep breath and get a little beyond the surface to the fact that I indeed had asked her about her day and had to take the time to listen to find out how her day had been. I'm in my office. And I've got uh, three or four things I've got to get done for Nancy that she wants me to look over uh, before she uh, puts them to print. Uh, and then I've got a few other things i got to do before chapel, and I'm frenetically trying to do it. And I've got these uh, post-it notes. The great thing about these post-it notes, uh, on them may be names of people whose lives are in disarray. Uh, but for me, they can be prioritized when I get a moment to respond. And so on my computer, uh, there are names X, Y, and Z, I can attend to. Uh, except when they get impatient that their lives are upside down and I haven't gotten back to them yet, and they decide to come to church. Uh, and they come in, and Nancy says, do you have a few minutes to meet with them? And I'm thinking, no. Uh, and I'm like, well, maybe a couple minutes. So I invite them into my office, and uh, I'm embarrassed to admit, I, I start with, well, I only have a couple of minutes. And as they start to tell their sacred story, their story of how their lives got turned upside down, I'm thinking to myself, how much do they need? Uh, and uh, I'm cataloging that story um, uh, and, and, and not necessarily giving the wholeness of their brokenness, the wholeness of their unique story. The attention isn't built on. And I'm frustrated there in my office because I have things to do. And then I take a deep breath and realize what it must have taken to come into the church. What a humbling thing it might be. What their life might look like as they walk outside those doors. And how little the amount that I might be able to help uh, really might do for them. But how much listening to them may help. And hopefully, hopefully I take a deep enough breath to get beneath my surface response. I think this story today is incredible, and I think it is a perfect gospel story in its imperfection. So many times people will take this story and they'll try to iron it out and make it neat, uh, to make Jesus uh, the same always affable, lovable hero that he is uh, week in and week out. And I think the power of this story is that the incarnation is that the one who made us, the one who has watched us through all of life, only fully, fully understands what life is when he lives it. And in this story, please excuse me, he's a jerk. Jesus is acting like a jerk. Like all of us do, because we're human. And even though he's fully divine, he is fully human. And I don't think those windows uh, with him in that desperate moment in the garden or him on a cross have the same power if his full humanity is not full. If he can't always pull himself up by his full divinity, I don't think we get the same encounter with a God who came to walk as we walk, to be grumpy when we wake up. And I think in this story, uh, 
Jesus was tired. He was exhausted. Ever since the feeding of the 5,000, he has been looking for some place to lay his head, some place where he can go unbothered. He crosses the Sea of Galilee into Gentile territory thinking, maybe I can catch my breath, uh, and people crowd in on him. And so he goes all the way to Tyre, uh, a place where he should be unknown, where his people aren't there, an entirely Gentile place. 35 miles away, several days' journey, and he goes there, I don't think, on a mission trip to build houses. I think he went there to hide. I think he gets to a place, he kicks his feet up, he's almost asleep, thinking, this is it. And then this woman comes in and catches him at that unfortunate human place where he's like, oh, couldn't you have left a post-it note? And he says something horrible. He uses the word that we would use for a female dog. He's not uh, making a, a cuddly euphemism for, you know, he is using a derogatory, insulting, dehumanizing comment. And it comes from the surface. It doesn't come from deep within his heart. It comes from that response that we have when we're frustrated. Because he's human. And he calls her a dog. She, she's not there because he's the, 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 the new, new spiritual uh, quick fix. He's, she's not there to see what uh, he's about. He's, she's not there out of curiosity. She's there out of the desperation that a mother has for her ailing child, that she would do anything, try anything, uh, and everything else has failed, and maybe, just maybe, this person might give my daughter her life back. And in that passionate, uh, absolutely unequivocal love of a mother, she challenges Jesus and says, yes, but even the dogs get crumbs. And in that moment, Jesus realizes what he's been doing, in my estimation. And he takes a deep breath. And he says, you know what? You're right. Your daughter is well. I think one of the beautiful things in Mark is that if the story didn't fall deep enough into our psyche from the first reading. It's sandwiched with another story. Mark does that. And the next story that I think informs the first, the story of a man who's deaf, who comes to Jesus, um, and Jesus, after he's he's, he's touched his tongue and 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 he's put spit in his ears, he says, Ephatha, which means be opened. Be opened. Go back, and your mind starts to travel back to the previous story, the story of Jesus, where he is, in fact, opened. Jesus Christ, who empties himself on the cross, fully human, fully divine, for the sins of all of us, is opened up by a desperate mother. In the incarnation, God, who became fully human, becomes more fully human, becomes more opened up by the humanity of a mom desperately in love trying to fix her daughter. And he's moved. He's opened up so he can be poured out. We are called to enter fully into the divine life, to be opened up by God so that God can fill us so that our lives might be poured out for others. As James reminds us, It's when we receive faith. It's when we open ourselves up to the power of God. It's when we receive that faith that our lives make it so we can't go back the same way. We have to be transformed. Our lives are altered. Just like Jesus' life was altered by that woman. We're altered by our encounter with God. May this year, as we roll up our sleeves and we dig into a new year, may this be the year that we leave by another way. Whether it's through uh, entering into fully uh, the way of love, the spiritual discernment of how we live this life of faith, whether it's by rolling up our sleeves and encountering God in the human lives, the broken, often broken lives of others, whether it's by serving at the altar, or whether it's by committing a little bit more deeply to this, God is inviting us to be opened up so that we, like God himself, can be poured out for the lives of the world.